Hello. I'd like to um, welcome everybody in the community to the first um, presentation at Gallery at Cal IT2, uh, stands for um, California Information Technology 2, as also part of QI or the Qualcomm Institute. Um, I'm excited to uh, be able to present online to multiple different communities, uh, sharing different platforms. Uh, the work of Jen Liu, visual artist from New York, and her collaborator, Dr. Sumeya Yar, uh, at this time at the Cold Springs Harbor Laboratory, and the work entitled Gold Loop Triad 2020. Uh, but before we start our um, introduction of the work, I wanted to thank Dr. Ramesh Rao, uh, who has been so deeply supportive of Gallery at Cal IT2, and our continued uh, presentation of work by artists uh, around the world, nationally and locally, as well as here at UCSD that are investigating, experimenting, and expanding the vocabulary of art and technology. My name is Ricardo Dominguez. I'm an associate professor in the visual arts department in the computing arts um, space of making. And so this kind of work is of special interest to me as a practitioner as well. And uh, the co-chair, uh, Jordan Crandall, uh, also a visual arts professor at UCSD. And I would also like to thank the entire community who have come together to establish this multi-platform uh, space for the presentation of the work of Jin Liu. Um, and that is particularly a big thank you to uh, Trish Stone and Hector and Maximo and uh, lots of new people I've met. So, um, uh, welcome, and we'll move forward. Uh, we're going to do introductions, then Jen's going to present her work, and then we'll have a Q&A between ourselves, and then open it up. So, uh, Jen Liu is a visual artist uh, based in New York, working uh, mostly in video, choreographic performance, biomaterial, and painting to explore topics of national identity, gendered economies, neoliberal industrial labor and the re-motivating of archival artifacts. Problem solving methods are applied to social, complex social uh, issues, then permitted to progress in their own logical, to their own logical conclusions, create speculative narratives seemingly beyond reason, perhaps not irrational, but non-rational, revealing elements of false consciousness and the limitations of existing solutions, Historical materialism across uh, cultural types is embodied in the everyday administrative and industry texts, uh, while props, costumes, and animation take tropes to the ridiculous extreme, a kind of surreal techno-materialist investigation. And uh, she is one of the important figures in, in participating in that language. She has received multiple uh, grants and residencies, uh, she is the recipient of the Creative Capital Award uh, in 2019 and 2018, the LACMA Art Plus Technology Lab Grant, 2017 Guggenheim Fellowship in Film and Video, uh, 2017 NYSCA uh, Fellowship in Digital and Electronic Arts. She has shown all over the world, the Whitney Museum, uh, Kunsthaus Zurich and uh, the ICA in London, and uh, it's uh, something um, of a, you know, really a strong uh, space of uh, being able to welcome uh, her work here um, to a gallery at Cal IT2. She is currently a full-time film and video faculty at Bennington College, Vermont. And uh, she is deeply involved in collaborations. Uh, and tonight we'll see one of those collaborations between molecular artists and artist scientists and the kind of synthesizing gestures they create. So I'd like to welcome Jen and Simuye, and uh, uh, I'll uh, bring on Jen. 
Hi. Um, I don't have very much uh, time to talk, so I'm going to do like a little bit of a lightning hello, a slight overview of the project. Uh, then we're probably going to uh, jump over to YouTube uh, or see YouTube. Oh, the the uh, video is going to start soon. So um, what is happening uh, with Gold Loop Triad is that it's one chapter of um, of essentially four chapters uh, within a greater body of work called Pink Slime Caesar Shift, uh, which um, I want to say uh, came out of a lot of uh, elements that I'll go into later, but um, what it is is really a long-term project in which I was trying to figure out ways to continue to talk about labor, labor activism in China, particularly around um, electronics and um, modern technologies, uh, which is very easy to forget on the consumer side, um, but nevertheless um, is ongoing. Um, and to find a container in order to carry me through that, an artistic conceptual container to carry me through an extended period of uh, inquiry into this and reminder essentially of audiences of these facts. So uh, the carrier of this um, is a slightly speculative proposal having to do with um, the mass scaling and in, in vitro meat. Now in vitro meat is an existing technology. It's a technology based on um, using stem cells in order to create, let's say like hamburgers and things like that. Um, but it's not currently mass scalable. Uh, um, now, um, but should that be mass scalable, what kind of um, possibilities might arise, not just around, of course, the cultures of food, the economies of food, but other things. Um, and in particular, could it be used as a carrier for a different kind of message? Now, this idea, uh, and we'll get into that, this idea of embedding um, secret messages into other materials is key with, uh, for this whole project. So on a kind of narrative scale, um, a kind of internal narrative scale, the idea is to take um, the uh, in vitro cells and embed them with new uh, genetic material, material that is data. It's not, um, it doesn't change the biological facts or uh, realities of the cells, but um, it can be decoded into information for labor activism. On the other hand, within the greater project, this idea of using um, not only speculative narratives, um, but also uh, genetic lab work and taking that genetic lab work quite seriously, as well as um, a kind of collage approach to firsthand accounts um, inside industry documents, many of which are not really um, supposed to be used for general audiences, certainly not our audiences, um, cutting them together in order to create um, sort of poetic, no, I don't want to say musings, it's a little bit more than that, but ways of thinking through uh, the realities of um, the economic and material um, uh, conditions of our um, everyday existence, inquiring into those in some, with some kind of psychological or emotional fidelity. Um, that, so in some ways, that's the kind of um, sort of uh, overall hidden message as well, to take all these things together and then to kind of uh, insert something else in and through them. Now, I'll let us go to the video, um, but it is very specific. Um, I do just want to remind you guys really quickly that the um, voiceover that you'll hear, for the most part, that's um, firsthand, again, firsthand accounts, um, inside industry docs, things like that. So with that, um, I'm gonna clock out and we'll uh, watch some video together. I think I start again. Hi. Um, so uh, I am I'm so sorry. I thought I was going to have a little bit more time to uh, introduce the piece. Uh, so you guys got a little bit of a cold, uh, cold read approach to um, the piece. Um, I'm actually going to just jump into a, a screen uh, share right now. Hello. Um, so I think I start again. I think I start again. 
Um, so uh, I am I'm so sorry. I thought I was going to have a little bit more time to uh, introduce oh, the piece. And I oh, so you guys got a little, little bit of a cold, uh, cold read. That's it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I think that I should go now. Uh, so, okay. So uh, with the slideshow. Um, all right, so Pink Slime Caesar Shift. Uh, I'm gonna zip through this and get to actually where this uh, is that you just saw, but I just want to remind you what you saw was the first chapter of three chapters that will be um, unrolled over these coming weeks. Uh, check in with the Cal IT to website for the exact dates. Okay, so um, Pink Slime Caesar Shift. Uh, I went into it just a tiny bit. Um, it came about uh, originally, um, through uh, some leftover questions and research that I had for my last body of work, uh, which had to do with um, resolving uh, shortages in pork um, and by extension, catastrophic ecological decline in China through a return to Maoist uh, principles. Now, um, after that, uh, after that body of work was done, uh, I was still interested in the conversations I had with uh, multiple agriculturalists in China. Um, uh, particularly uh, with pressures on the meat uh, pork market um, and uh, shortages, there was intensified demand for beef. Um, and the problem was there's a primary shortfall with the beef industry in China is that it's a land intensive industry and they had already hit the resource ceiling by about 2016. So what that means is no more beef cows could already be developed, grown, um, farmed, um, then were already being farmed at that moment in time in 2016. The land itself um, had ended, it was, uh, they had already hit the resource ceiling. So um, this is a chart um, for um, uh, imports. Uh, that's the kind of side story of these intensifying imports that continue, as you can see, and through to 2020, they're just increasing and increasing. Um, and then we keep on hearing these kind of background chatters on agricultural deals, no matter what kind of uh, trade wars are happening between China and US, there's always some kind of agricultural deal happening in the background and it's because of beef and pork. Uh, so um, nevertheless, um, the demand increases, the continued inability to actually provide um, uh, domestically continues, um, and just, just a cute little side, um, to uh, underscore the seriousness of the um, situation. This is just the bottom tags of the uh, site that that last um, uh, graph was from. So disaster and beef. Now, um, that said, okay, so uh, what are the solutions for that? There's multiple uh, routes of um, uh, speculative capital, uh, investment capital uh, in various technologies. Obviously, we live in an impossible uh, meat world right now, but around 2016, 2017, there was still very much and still continues to be venture capital around um, in vitro based meats. So, uh, so I was sort of thinking about that intrigued by the idea of big vats of meat. Uh, it's been a, a long ongoing sci fi trope. Now, uh, on the other hand, totally different kind of resource problem. Um, ongoing small scale labor protests in China. This was actually a slightly larger one from 2018 for the JASIC um, uh, protests. And JASIC is a uh, kind of welding, uh, a British welding corporation, but uh, with a very big um, factory in uh, Shenzhen. So uh, anyway, uh, I don't want to talk about JASIC too much alone, but um, I around the same time, 2016, 2017, I was in Hong Kong and met with a lot of labor NGOs, labor activists, um, just figuring out what was going on with them. Um, and in their conversations, they repeatedly brought up their inability to organize large scale protests over the long term uh, due to uh, social media censorship, the disappearance of their content, 
alongside the physical disappearance of their activists on the ground. So this kind of dual disappearance. Um, and so um, these small uh, protests would keep on going, you know, but they would just kind of fizzle out. Now, this was uh, when I was meeting with them, they were still talking very much around those Foxconn suicides, this, uh, Foxconn being the factory for um, Apple, multiple factories for Apple. Um, and, uh, you know, um, they, there was a lot um, that they thought about that, particularly the international media attention to it, but that just also eventually fizzled out also. But another kind of disappearance, literally throwing oneself um, out the window. Um, and to be honest, it still continues. Um, there's just, you know, international media has other things to think about right now. So even though um, there was even one that happened in March 2020, no coverage, right? It's already, um, people already got that taste of that little sensational taste uh, in the teens. So, um, so what to do about that, a resource problem. Social media uh, can't get through all this kind of stuff for all these uh, protesters. So is the solution in vitro beef, perhaps? Um, how? Um, so one of the uh, questions uh, could be, um, if there isn't a social media network or media network that can carry um, organizing messages, information, education across um, very localized word of mouth areas, are there other different kinds of networks that could be misappropriated in order to fill that need? Uh, so uh, in vitro meat. What happens there? What happens when it gets uh, mass scaled? Uh, according to, I'm not the expert, according to uh, various geneticists I spoke to at that time, part of a mass scaled schema would be that the meat itself would have to be checked for pathogens multiple times a day. Um, unlike in vivo or inside the animal agriculture, uh, uh, collapsing cows, some spotty livers, uh, you can know to pull the meat from production. Um, but there's no easy visual way to tell if the cells have gone bad or have dangerously mutated, which can happen in this kind of like bio heavy sort of uh, genetic, uh, genetically modified um, cell lines. So, uh, Non-specialized workers would have to be given the tools to check the cells down to the genetic level. Uh, and given today's technologies, um, relatively inexpensive technologies, um, it wouldn't be too hard to actually insert new non-pathogenic genetic code. In fact, code that does um, turn into, let's say, data. So uh, that's just the workflow. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> Right, okay. Uh, so what happens if a, a factory worker were able to insert messages, data messages into the, um, be, in this case, it's beef in vitro cells, then they could put to work the um, domestic, not to say international, but at least the domestic food distribution networks. Now, obviously this isn't a chart for uh, domestic food networks, but it is in fact um, just a reminder uh, of how modern industrial production distribution works, right? So if you modify something in one factory, it very well could spread over an entire geographic region, multi one, an entire country, even one as large as China. So in this case, replacing social media networks with food distribution networks as a channel for resistant content, right? So just a small side note, uh, we'll get into the technicals hopefully a little bit when Sumeya, when we get into the panel discussion moment, but um, this is a kind of a, a international standard for um, uh, amino acid, um, the, the three parts. Uh, and um, this is a amino acid abbreviation system indeed. Um, so, uh, just to say that um, basically, given this kind of general framework that uh, you could use the near future technology of mass scaled in vitro meat in order to 
um, hide secret messages, I then approached Sumeya and said, can we do this? Can we actually make this real um, speculative? Speculation is all in fine, right? But I was interested to see what other kind of ideas could happen when we actually took the science quite seriously and really went about investing in lab proofs. Right. So the messages themselves, in this case, the cells that um, are of concern today, um, do integrate um, 40 methods of nonviolent protest, a text, a textual list. Um, and that textual list is then uh, uh, translated into pinyin, and then pinyin is then translated via the international uh, standard for abbreviation of amino acids. Right. Um, so anyone who has a rudimentary knowledge of it, which surely a worker working in such a bio intensive uh, industry would, they could just read the code and just blah, blah, blah. Now, how do they know where to work? We inserted or Sumeya inserted a, uh, a, for, a bioluminescent marker uh, that makes the cell glow yellow under certain UV lights. Right. So uh, this is some uh, proofs. We did it. Um, it was happened, it worked. Um, and this is uh, the uh, by uh, the um, microscopes at uh, Biobus at uh, Columbia. Uh, so uh, this is with no uh, UV light. This is with UV light lab proof. The cell is still living. It glows bright yellow. And thus we then know that all that data follows the yellow portion, right? The yellow encoding portion here again different, just a little uh, section of the same plate, uh, normal lighting, and here we go. Very easily identifiable um, cell that's screaming, I have extra information for you, ready for you. Uh, okay, so uh, just really quickly, um, how did we do it? We used the method of gold biolistics, and I promise I'll wrap this up in like all of two minutes. Um, so gold biolistics, uh, right, so, um, what is gold biolistics? Um, so pink slime Caesar shift, um, one of the um, frameworks that makes it extend over a long period of time is that it is in chapters overall, right? And each of those chapters, four chapters, are based on different methods of um, modifying genetic material. In this case, it was biolistics. I was really intrigued at the get-go by just the method itself, which is to coat gold microparticles with your uh, desired DNA content and then actually shooting them into the cells themselves. I love the look of this kind of promotional uh, uh, inside industries sort of uh, brochure, biolistic delivery systems, all these gold balls, right? All this, you know, it's energy, it's pure energy. It's not death. It's new life, mutated new life. So uh, this uh, got built into a video uh, from 2018, Pink Slime Caesar Shift. It's on Vimeo. You can watch it at any time. It generally leaves out the framework for the overall project. But we finally did it. Uh, I believe in 2019, we uh, the cells turned yellow because we actually shot them full of uh, microparticles of gold with all this genetic content. Now, during this process, in the process of the lab work, I got really intrigued by where exactly the gold came from, right? Um, and uh, it turns out uh, that um, uh, it was very likely uh, recovered from e-waste. Uh, and now this is where things start to go circular. Now, e-waste recycling itself um, is referred to uh, generally um, as uh, a kind of circular economy design uh, trope, right? You kind of design the, uh, the equipment to be easily recycled so it's less toxic. When your phone goes, it doesn't go to ground, it becomes recycled, right? So circular economy. But I was also intrigued by this idea of, in all my research on the women, most often than not, who were producing the phones and the laptops and the factories, they were getting sick, industrially sick, from the solvents that they would use um, to, let's say, clean it, getting it ready for export to us. Then, because of the circular economy, those same phones, after they'd gone through their kind of um, life cycle, would arrive back in a very similar geographic region, and their cousins, their fe often female cousins, would be the ones to smash it apart by hand. These phones, these laptops, smashing them apart by hand uh, and releasing all the um, toxins back out of the uh, 
glass. Now, uh, so um, that is where this piece starts. So gold loop uh, triad, what, um, what kind of implications happen through thinking through that kind of process and that kind of circulation of toxicity? Uh, trigger alert, there's a little bit of distressing medical um, images just coming up real quick and also to zoom through them uh, and get through that as quickly as possible. So gold recovery, motherboard, oh, so lovely, the gold ball, uh, right? Exactly, I like those gold balls. Everyone loves to look at gold balls. Now, gold balls, right? Uh, so this is, um, uh, these uh, gold balls, what about gold balls? The abstraction of gold balls to, in fact, uh, pus-filled gold warts, gold-colored warts on the polycystic kidneys of an e-waste worker in Guayu, right? So what kinds of aesthetic echoes actually happen? What kind of falls from grace from abstraction to actual ground on the ground realities happen when we look very, very closely at the facts of circular economies, um, right? So the lovely, iPhone 12, right? And these kind of like balls that promise uh, a perfect future uh, now and uh, just at the tip of your hands, right? And the reality, of course, these piles of waste after the fact. And again, let's think about all those kind of like pus filled warts kind of like growing inside on their kidneys as they decompose, manually decompose these um, objects, abstract objects of perfection. Um, and then of course, within this, we wanna think about circularity, oh, uh, not circularity, um, liquidity. Um, and what we heard in the video in the very first part are actually the stages of e-waste recycling, much of which is very centered on vats of hydrochloric acid, of cyanide, of all this. And of course, it leaches into the water, it leaches into the water table itself. So, um, so what happens when that happens, right? When um, the dissolving of the plastic encasing the gold that you want to get to, what happens when that leaches into the ground, the, the materiality of disappearance of dissolving, right? What happens? These things happen. No time to get into that, but these things happen. And we know what this is because it happened in the 60s and 70s in Japan. It was very, very well um, explored in which particularly things like cadmium poisoning uh, that's released from all our cadmium batteries, they cause the bones to uh, essentially disintegrate inside your body. Um, they break under the weight of themselves, right? Your, the body, the hands, they, but more so the body itself folds in on itself. It becomes a ball and it disappears inside itself. So to wrap it all up, Gold Loop is, if nothing, an exploration of the idea of disappearance, right? And particularly in light of these kind of like hyper um, developed discourses of corporate um, and media um, assimilation of the spectacle of protest, is it possible to speculate a different model of um, protest, one that rises from, in some ways, the necessity of protest amidst its almost impossibility, although, of course, now is an interesting time to talk about this. Um, and can we think about other models? So again, in other chapters, that'll be explored more. Um, and I believe that I've gotten to the end of my slideshow. I hope I didn't get too late, but um, I'm all done. <laughs> If you guys want to open it up to something else. I think that we have a panel discussion. Oh, but I'm supposed to, I'm going to now introduce. All right, okay. Hi everybody. Uh, so now we're about to go to the panel discussion. I am now introducing uh, Sumeya Yar. Uh, Sumeya Yar is uh, my amazing uh, collaborator and biologist partner in this venture. Uh, she's a scientist, science educator and biomaker with a PhD in biochem and molecular genetics from the University of Illinois 
in Chicago. Uh, she previously worked as a postdoctoral researcher at Northwestern, uh, researching the link between cardiovascular and metabolic disorders. She's a published author of numerous scientific articles and conference proceedings, um, and the recipient of several pre uh, prestigious, extremely prestigious, <coughs> doctoral and postdoctoral level research grants. So currently, uh, she is a science educator at the DNA Learning Center at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Uh, she's also an instructor at GenSpace, a community lab based in Brooklyn, uh, which we've done a little bit of stuff together uh, there. Um, so uh, she's concentrating at GenSpace, um, but overall it seems that she's developing and running um, interdisciplinary hands-on educational programs um, and uh, things like uh, her interdisciplinary colorant sustainability workshop series uh, was awarded a public outreach grant by the Center for Science and Society at Columbia University uh, and in her spare time. So aside from all these amazing things that she's doing with uh, education, uh, she also likes uh, tinkering with uh, and developing affordable and sustainable educational research tools. Um, so she designed a 3D printed camera lucida microscope, a reinvention of a historical drawing tool. Um, and uh, she's in general uh, passionate about creating sustainable solutions for today's complex socio-ecological challenges. And um, she believes that cross-disciplinary engagement is the key to bringing new solutions to our global challenges. Um, and hopefully uh, what we are up to together is just a tiny, tiny part of that. Um, so uh, I welcome both Sunea and Ricardo to come and join me um, because I'm starting to feel very self-conscious here all by myself. <laughs> Hi, Dan. Uh, Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you Ricardo for having me. It's such a pleasure to be among you guys and thank you for the amazing presentation. Uh, such a yeah. pleasure. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both. I, I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing this uh, gesture that is collaboratively uh, developed uh, and, you know, is layered in multiple uh, questions that are about um, both uh, the slow violence of environmentalism, the kind of uh, circuit that uh, toxicity of labor is very much uh, almost like a long-term issue that uh, a theorist uh, that I like called the anthro-obscene, and that is that uh, the the research that both of you are doing uh, is allowing us to not only come to understand the kind of circularity of toxicity as a core economy of the material structure of technology that we're using at this very moment as well, uh, but you've been able to collaborate in creating both uh, uh, this kind of amazing non-rational and directed language of what it feels like perhaps uh, in an abstract sense to exist in this sensibility of uh, being sort of uh, cured and poisoned by this thing uh, that you see in this gold sphere that uh, you know is, is sort of everywhere in this territory uh, literally fo folding into the skin the landscape and no matter how beautiful we imagine it we can see its toxicity eating us inside out in mm -hmm. the kind of most horrific manner that this circular economy is developed. And, uh, and it's sometimes extremely difficult to sort of break through the beauty of these spheres of technology, uh, these tactile connective systems, and to see the way they are embedding in the bodies of communities that are invisible, are eliminated in various ways just by kind of toxic elimination to give us the ability to be, you know, pandemically privileged, basically, right? We are um, part of that uh, 
poison system, this anthroobscene. And what I find really fascinating in terms of the discussion with you uh, uh, of uh, molecular biology and how do we test this out? How do we make aesthetics hit the ground in terms of being able to see the way these particles are enfolded in our bodies, but yet allow them to encrypt or a signal that resistance is possible and that you've literally tested it, done test tube, you know, testing. And so uh, I guess what I would like to hear, Simui, is how do you see your collaboration uh, with Jen uh, in, in this process that you guys have developed? How, how do you see your experimentation, your knowledge base, you know, amplifying uh, this kind of uh, world that is too much ours, but yet uh, its own world, I guess. Um, a long question, but just how, how do you work within this structure in your testing and thinking around environmentalism and toxicity? Yeah, I mean, our collaboration started very organically, but um, at first I didn't really know what to expect from collaborating with an artist, but then as it unfolded, and when I realized that Jen was very, very serious about the experimental part of things, uh, keeping them real, then it got easier because I didn't really have to do anything other than what I used to do in the lab, I just, you know, do my science. But on the side, uh, it was very stimulating to work with her because she always asked the unexpected question and then kind of pushed me out of my comfort zone sometimes. But uh, I welcome that uh, because that that was a learning curve uh, trying to answer her question. Uh, so it, it kept me on my toes. Um, and yeah, we keep, kept everything real. All the uh, research experiments, everything was real, as real as we could keep them when we first met. She came to me and she said she wants to do in vitro meat. And I was like, uh, okay, that's mm -hmm. kind of a million dollar industry. And we, I'm one person and we don't really have resources, but we may not be able to grow in vitro meat, but we can do this. We can grow cells that, that are part of meat, beef, muscle cells, basically. We can grow muscle cells. We can even grow them into a layer and then we can put them on top of each other and that forms a structure similar to me. It's not going to be huge, but it is still, you know, enough to meet your uh, project goal. And that's what we did. We took uh, muscle cells, bovine muscle cells, and we genetically modified them using different methods and uh, that those became a piece of speculative image from me at the end. And in terms of the um, question, Jen, that you are adding to this conversation, not only do we have uh, the kind of uh, method of uh, evaluating um, how toxicity is part of this circular liquidity uh, that infects labor everywhere, especially in in, in areas in Asia, and the kind of research that you're doing in this kind of synthetic uh, structure of experimentation, of embedding into meat itself, uh, and, uh, the core question of resistance, uh, of encryption, of uh, how does one develop uh, a contestational resistant culture in this space of labor. And so I, I think that uh, for me, the collaboration between uh, uh, Sumaya's uh, testing on, you know, having art hit the meat, if you will, and your own kind of non-rational speculative culture, uh, suddenly meeting around this question of resistance uh, as a practice of imagining speculative uh, ways of communicating among labor um, seems really uh, strong in the term experimental. 
in terms of experimenting, experimental art, but also experimenting other forms of contestation, resistance, and communications from those that are toxic, toxicity, to invisible through toxicity, I guess, toxically invisible. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about uh, how you're both, you know, uh, participating in, in that sort of thinking? Uh, and to what degree does the true, quote unquote, empirical experiment allow you, Jen, to begin to layer the triad or the gold loop um, at the edges of the speculative? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. I got gotcha. you. I can run with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I uh, I think that um, on the first. On, on the first hand, there's a philosophical positioning, I think, that um, is really important for me. Um, but I, I think it relates to the things, for instance, that you've done in the past, where this idea of poetry or beauty is not necessarily mutually exclusive from um, critical approaches to um, political um, political realities. Um, and that this question of what it means to align with and ally with um, resistance, um, people engaged as, as non-artists, as activists, um, uh, to presuppose that the entirety of what could be done is the kind of um, presentation of poverty porn to the global north like that as the only solution i don't find acceptable right mm -hmm. so as soon as that is kind of um, blown up a bit um there's a lot of other possibilities that are available um and so for me yeah it was very important um to have direct conversations um at the very beginning um even before I even thought that um, I could do lab work, it was really important to talk with people who were uh, actually working with um, agricultural sciences. It was very important to meet with uh, genetic in, uh, researchers before I met Sumeya um, and have conversations that were very uncomfortable for me, but helped illuminate exactly what was um possible which actually when we look at the internet unless one is a specialist and we we uh so often fall it's so easy to fall into our specialized knowledge vortexes right um so it's very hard to um glean the kind of information um that i did glean um by meeting with these people in person it's very hard to glean that from just the internet um, and um, content that's coming at uh, uh, multiple levels of um, distance and um, filtering. Well, you know, can I ask you one question, both of you, in terms of the nature of toxicity and environmental or uh, technological toxicity? Uh, one of the issues that I looked at uh, when I first came to Cal IT2 in 2004 was nanotoxicity. That is, how do nanoscale silver or gold uh, that was being used or uh, promoted in Levi's or Hugo Boss socks that didn't smell or what have you, uh, was that the nature of investigating toxicity uh, was not really valued in the big circular pie of research around these uh, kind of issues. And, uh, you know, Sumeya said, well, we don't really have the money or the funding to produce the large-scale project. So how do we reduce messaging? Um, uh, that is, I guess I'm just trying, how does toxicity then uh, enter into this this aesthetic that you're discussing yeah. and process. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. There's there's th two things I would want to say. One is general and one is specific. So on the first hand, generally, I think that um, it's very hard to like inquire into any anything's materiality today in like 2020 or 2016 or 2017 for that matter, um, without hitting up against a. a a wall of toxicity eventually. And at that eventually actually doesn't, it doesn't take very long, right? It's just kind of like, you look into the materiality and then there it is, 
right? It's a before, it's before life, it's during life, and it's long, long after life as intense toxicity on all sorts of scales. But of course, it all eventually deteriorates and becomes nanoscaled and then builds itself into our biologies after the fact. But it doesn't take very much. You just have to like look at it for more than a second and for more look at it more incisively than as a kind of end consumer and then you're already there right so um once uh Sumeya and i started um working together it, it was almost inevitable right like as soon as remember i i remember when that like that that um capsule of like very expensive micro gold came in Sumeya, were we there together and i was like oh my god look at this and then i was like where did that come from you know? And as soon as where did that come from uh, becomes a question, then the whole thing kind of builds itself. But I, I do want to say also that um, there was something I, after a, working with Sumeya for a while, it was, it, I was almost primed for it already. And so maybe you can talk to this a bit, but um, it was shocking to me be, not being a scientist, how much waste we were actually producing throughout. Um, it's such a, big part of lab work. Um, and so this idea of waste was already on my mind. So I was almost, uh, it was almost inevitable, right, that I was going to fall into this. But again, it's just materiality in the, in the 21st century anyway. Right? But the thing, and I agree with you, but Sume, I was wondering, uh, in terms of your investigation and the way that you're teaching or thinking of the teachable, um, is toxicity uh, one measure that allows us to understand the kind of work that you might research and allow us to communicate uh, in terms of your own research? Um, or is, is toxicity just something that entered because of Jen's question? Where did the gold come from? I mean, it was Jen's question because she found me to address a specific project she already had in her mind. So I was helping her to run her project. She had a biology component mm -hmm. to her project. She needed help. So she found me and that's how it started. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't two way. It was more like one way. She, she wanted to do things and I helped her out, but um i myself in, in i am uh, also interested in pollution in general you know i, I the, one of the workshops that i run is about uh synthetic uh, dyes and pollution that are, that is created by synthetic colorants and um especially the pollution that's created in the lab is also very interesting to me it has always bothered me how much waste we are producing even in one day in the lab because most of the plastic we should only use once because they have to remain sterile and once you open them that's gone so you use it and you throw it away immense amount of uh, waste and most of the time you know you're working on one very small specific thing in a basic research lab and you are creating a very big problem why are trying to understand or find answer to a very small thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we have the luxury to do this anymore. And there are groups who are trying to reduce the waste in the lab actually right now. So I'm hopeful that soon mm -hmm. the waste is gonna somehow get lowered, use you know, recyclable plastics instead of um, regular plastic mm -hmm. um, some, somehow. Well, that's, yeah. I, I think that's something that, again, uh, connects for me uh, around what Jen is doing in terms of the aesthetics of the way our technology disappears toxicity in, in the circuit of liquidity. And, you know, we often imagine science is a clean science. That is, uh, uh, that it is, as you said, about a very precise, clean modality. We imagine, you know, the sealed up lab. Uh, but uh, what you're indicating is that science itself is a condition of waste uh, mm -hmm. to a degree that perhaps uh, technology itself on an everyday level is doing. And so to create a green science, I suppose, um, whatever that might be, or a green technology, 
might be part of that in, in tale of encryption. Um, you know, how do we clean up the anthro obscene uh, that even becomes a uh, part of uh, the communication? And it says, uh, would I like to enable attendees to turn on their cameras and microphones? Yes. Uh, uh, I, I welcome right now uh, questions to the um, uh, both the collaborators. Uh, but I, I was going to tell uh, you, um, Sume, when I first got here, I started working on um, nanotoxicity. Uh, and uh, I remember a scientist saying, you know, there's dirty science. And I was going, dirty science? And I, I now I perhaps understand. Uh, Pinar Yoldas, one of our uh, lead bioartists, speculative designers, and visionaries here, uh, who among uh, the community of net art, bio art, uh, uh, you know, Susan Anker and many others, Pinar is there and she says, thank you so much, Jen. Thank you, Sumaya Ricardo. This is a very strong project. Ricardo, I love Anthroobscene. Well, Anthroobscene loves you, Pinar. Uh, let's see, uh, it's, a, it's a complex project. It has multitude layers and requires the audience a certain kind of familiar familiarity with both scientific concepts you work with and sociocultural awareness uh, around the afterlife of everyday electronics. I guess my point is uh, it could come with a reading list. What are some of the responses you're receiving and how important is it to you that the project is accessible, uh, Jen? Thank you, Pinar. Thanks, Pinar. Um, it's very important that it's accessible. accessible. So yeah, um, usually, um, uh, let's say, it's complicated, sort of. I, it is complicated. And there usually is a kind of um, excerpt list after the videos, but the videos themselves, like this is the thing, it's like the inquiry is a complicated or potentially interpreted as complicated. Um, the ideas are scientific um, and otherwise, of course. Um, and uh, but the the video itself should be fairly um, accessible. And I think that that actually is one way in which uh, Sumeya and I might actually intersect. Also, this idea of like how. Um, our uh, respective areas of concern um, can actually be presented to um, a uh, generalized audience in some ways. So to some extent, like I wanna say that um, aesthetics are really important to me, um, making videos that are actually enjoyable, dare, dare I say it, <laughs> enjoyable, good looking things. Um, and I think that that in and of itself carries um, the kind of affective or emotional um, content that I is actually um, a big portion of what I'm trying to get across. So even if somebody is not like, you know, even if somebody sees the video and is like, I have no idea what the science is behind it, but I get the idea, like that's enough. Or this idea of like contestation and disappearance of a um, femme body um, and complicated feelings of, around that, that would be huge. That's more than enough. So a kind of um, a tiered, um, experience and um, um, uh, reception is acceptable. I mean, Sumeya, how do you feel? Because certainly you're working with um, students at all these different levels, and but joy and beauty and wonder is definitely part of this too, even if they don't really understand the kind of foundational concepts sometimes, right? Yes. And um, just, just one point, spoiler, actually, it gets clearer as you watch the second and third parts of the video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and when I am giving workshops, I try to incorporate some form of art making into my teaching because it definitely uh, brings in more engagement. And also, it's, it's a way of, uh, I see there's a way to, for, um, students or attendees to express what they learn like an outlet through art 
it definitely makes the communication easier too because people find it something more familiar art art part more familiar than the science part so um they find it easier to engage with the material i'm gonna say yeah does that answer no, I, I do think that one of the elements is this notion of non-rational that is mm -hmm. that there is it's not irrational and it's not the hyper rational but it allows this bridging and I, I think one of the uh, amazing qualities of the uh, presentation and gesture is that not only are you layering it within these kind of formal, uh, you know, evocative, choreographed sensibilities of shaping uh, tone, color, form, uh, but you also uh, seem to be attached to a wider sense of uh, a kind of micro narratives. Uh, that this is part of a larger story, uh, a larger investigation. And so I was interested in the notion of triad, uh, which to me is a, a triptych or a trilogy, but also triad carries with it uh, an underground and vicious economy. Um, so uh, could you speak a little bit about this uh, question of, uh, as uh, Sumay said, as you watch the series, perhaps you get a, a better sense of what the concerns are um, and what triad uh, functions in, in terms of the three pieces. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure. Um, uh, definitely it does become clearer. Thank you. And I'm glad it became clear for you, Samaya. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, I think, um, triad was less specific i was using it uh, if i might if it's not so terrible to be honest uh, about it i was using it more as a general um designation i think um how to talk about a three chaptered serial project while yes indeed uh, talking uh, referencing a certain kind of um yeah underground affiliation with violent undertones um, that was definitely of interest to me, but um, talking specifically about the history of triads um, was, I'm not sure that I'm like exactly capable of. Um, well, it just struck me that you chose not trilogy or uh, triptych uh, yeah. or, you know, any other three. Uh, but triad, and one of the things that seemed important in the work, Jen, was that it was situated in a very specific uh, embodiment of gender and labor uh, in Asia. Yeah. Uh, so I, perhaps I overread triad. Oh, no, uh, not at all. You know? No, because there are kind of little, there's, it, in some ways, like, while there's major, there's major references obviously happening and major uh, narrative thoroughfares within this project and the overall body of work, like, there's also these kind of um, inside inside jokes do you know what i mean some of which that, that can be taken like uh, on any number of levels so it's like um yeah triad would kind of be one of those like i like this idea that like in some ways um the idea of triad itself um tracks back to a certain kind of like religious um geometric diagramming and this idea of like diagramming and network kind of like laying out a kind of landscape through geometric connections is like kind of uh, very related to this work um mm -hmm. but really, like i can't make them equivalent but there's some kind of philly echo there um and then the mythology of the triads versus the reality of the triads which i don't even like i don't really have access to but certainly i do know that it does exist as a kind of like any kind of um, mafia sort of like um, existed on various levels in various times according to different needs right and that paired with its um it's not necessarily needing um point like it, it runs parallel to its mm -hmm. um, mythology right um so that in and of itself is really interesting to me as well um 
And this idea of thinking through technology, it's mythology, but what un lies underneath it, not really sure. You know what I mean? So like, again, like more echoes mm -hmm. rather than analysis, if that makes sense. Well, I, I think that kind of triangulation of uh, technology, uh, kind of techno myth, mm -hmm. and also a techno poetics. Mm -hmm. And it, they're often charged with a kind of secret citationality, uh, kind of aesthetic uh, encryption, if you will, in form. And one of the elements that I was thinking in terms of the history of, say, Pinar's here and, uh, uh, and the history of bio artists or molecularly framed artists, uh, I was thinking of, um, uh, you know, Pinar's work. Uh, but also uh, early kind of DNA conversion stuff that Eduardo Koch was doing in 99. Um, uh, that is that uh, there is an interest in how do we uh, embed ourselves uh, through these, these mediums as a way to communicate. Often painters did it, uh, filmmakers do it through sort of, uh, you know, different colors and forms. Uh, but with bio art, it seems that there is also a, a sense that we want to uh, embed these secret citations, sites of exchange. Um, you know, I, and I don't know, your work seems to echo that. And then the other layer you, you also bring through your experimentation is that you are also, in a certain sense, teleporting these uh, intro things into objects in the world, um, either through film, but literally in the wider piece of your epic, right, uh, which is the, the pink, um, there are objects that are produced. Oh, are which Sumeya totally reminded me of. So I got it from my studio. There it <laughs> is, see? right? This is a case. Mm -hmm. Did I show this to you when I was in San Diego last? No, but you spoke about it. Uh, it opens up. And there's a bracelet inside. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you got the proposal around this. So it's a lovely bracelet. And then if you can see, there's like a little capsule embedded in the acrylic. And that actually has those yellow cells <laughs> inside of them. So yes, absolutely. And it's a bracelet. Yeah. That's, yeah by some nice lady uh, and it has a whole nother narrative that I'm gonna get not gonna get into but it's all yeah it's all related it's very important that it has a life uh, outside and that that life is something that people can relate to well I, I think that's the one of the things that is um, uh, important at this period in the wider history of bio art which was how do we, in the early forms of bio art, it's, well, how do we take the outside deep into the inside? Uh, how do we change that meat, that genetic code? Uh, and we were, you know, bringing Morris code or uh, what have you, uh, trying to, uh, you know, move inside of it. Uh, but it seems that if there is such a thing as post bio art, whatever that might be, post molecular, is this moment uh, that can be seen in the early work where you extrude, you create objects, uh, you sort of take what has been inside and mobilize it outside in a certain way through these objects, through these agencies of props, as part of your larger story as well. Um, so uh, those, the, the bracelet is not the only thing that has sort of been extruded out in the work, right? Um, and uh, Amy, did you want to ask something? I see you appearing magically hey, before me. Hi. 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 Uh, Amy Alexander. Uh, I don't know if you had a question. I actually, no, I actually right. turned, I turned on my camera by accident, but I, then I figured I'm here and I just didn't want to disappear. Hello, I'm sorry. Hello, I had hello. to, no, no, I had to okay. step out and I stepped back in the camera. It's all right. I, this we're, is great. Just keep going. I'll just yeah, listen. Yeah, yeah, we're all, we're all, we're all being <laughs> watched. Norman. Hello, yeah. everybody. But yeah. uh, can you give us just towards the end now, um, the, the sort of wider sense of 
you know, what this sort of narrative and this need to produce objects, uh, you know, I'm calling the extruded uh, sort of prototypes or active uh, props uh, that are important for this sense of the narrative or investigation or research, not only in the Petri dish or in the photographs, but, uh, you know, we've seen this kind of manifestation of things uh, being born out of this. Uh, is that something that has been important to the research and work, Jen? It's important to the work. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that it's important to, I mean, it has its own, I actually have, uh, the objects have their own line of research in a way, um, which I'm not sure now. Is the time. Mm -hmm. How they gonna... function for you? Yeah. yeah, but I, I think that um, uh, in general, um, I I don't have a long history of bio art. Mm -hmm. That's something that we could talk about actually, because Sumeya actually did expose herself to the bio art summit. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, but I uh, I am not I'm not by nature a bio artist, I would say. Uh, Pink Slime Caesar Shift is really the first time that I really uh, dared to even go here. And I think that um, for me, uh, stepping into this realm, it was really important to me to make sure that things were as material as possible um, and not to rely too much on um, um, the lightweightness of narrativity itself mm -hmm. paired with abstraction, oh, abstracted images, if that makes sense. Although certainly my pieces are abstract in their own ways, but um, it was, yeah, it was really important to me that um, the, the initial speculative uh, presuppositions would be continually challenged by the realities of the materiality of the um, work itself. Um, and that also, it was something that people could touch and that could loop back to things that were very concrete. So for instance, this bracelet itself, it's not just a pretty bracelet. Um, it also is modeled and uh, can be, it can be used exactly like anti-static bracelets that all the electronics workers have to use so that they don't short out the phones um, when they um, are cleaning them. Um, but it's also a way to um, monitor them to make sure that their bathroom breaks are not too long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so again, kind of like this idea of presenting um, these quite serious situations of, um, of oppression, right? Um, but uh, I think part of the sensibility, which is also a part of the project, in perhaps in its widest term, is the notion of uh, a sense of animation, the animated, the animancy, uh, something uh, that uh, is screenally based, uh, visually based, uh, and that something is being textured in the animation, uh, mm -hmm. in the kind of uh, moment between uh, the, you know, the bodies of the workers, the laborers, suddenly being, um, you know, uh, contaminated and and uh, somehow the, the synthetic animation goes into their body, right? The gold spheres at, at certain points in the narrative. Um, and so we had a discussion briefly uh, about animation, animacy in your work uh, as being an activator. Before we go, can you give us a, uh, maybe a sense of how that functions for you? Sure. I mean, I, I think that um, it it's uh, it's a sensibility and an idea that's kind of um, evolving and growing for me. But I think that in some ways I might actually kick this to Sumeya because I think that there's something about animacy that's like at the I mean, of course, at the heart of being a biologist. But I I suspect that like uh, in much of what she does as well, it's like it 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 almost feels natural. I know that there's a lot of discourses around animacy, but um, I, I take this materiality seriously. Again, as soon as we start to take a look at objects um, more in depth, 
not only do they they yield their toxicity, they yield their um, they're 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 not still right. Um, they're always discharging. They're always um, shimmering or resonating or vibrating or whatever it is. Right. There's so much to all matter. Um, but Sumeya, I mean, maybe you want to talk about this because in some ways, a lot of what you're doing in terms of education, right, is actually um, giving people the access to see that kind of life. Is that right? Um, in the, the microscopic life. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, maybe Ricardo can. Oh, well, you know, I, I, it was just interesting to me that one of the textures of the experiment is how does one animate uh, this kind of uh, deep uh, micro level of toxicity? Uh, how does one represent it? And uh, certainly Jen is using uh, animation uh, as a way to connect the way these micro toxicities enter the body, uh, even in the cleanest states of the economy. Uh, they seem to be about uh, the slow violence as well on the, on the gendered body of labor. Um, and so that we often think of vibrant matter, right? It's animated, oh, isn't it fantastic? But that, that vibrancy is also toxicity. It's also a weapon that reorganizes the body itself in hor horrific ways. Um, yeah, so well, our, mutating, our, mutating mm -hmm. the DNA, and mm -hmm. then uh, Jen has a piece on that, and her following parts that, that the DNA is being bombarded. Spoiler, um, yeah, that's the DNA damage. I say answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, yeah, micro level damage. Yeah, and that the the vibrancy of matter, uh, especially when it's organized in this uh, toxic liquidity. Uh, between clean abstraction of technology working like we're doing now and just the E uh, disaster, whether it's the disaster of beef or the disaster of whatever anthro-obscene material we need in terms of rare earth, uh, it, 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 it carries this poison at the same time that I think we all want to establish a cure. Uh, some way to, to speak to this issue uh, by making it visible, uh, by making it material, and at the same time, um, you know, uh, trying to speak to ourselves, right? Like the scientists that, are, that you were saying, Sumeya, we need a green science. Uh, why do we, you know, we've gotten rid of plastic bags here in California, supposedly. Uh, what would happen if scientists were to say we're no longer going to reuse this mm -hmm. material or we're going to have to figure out another way? Um, how do you animate that question among the scientific community? Um, yeah, I'm actually very surprised that this hasn't become an issue yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 the waste is huge. I mean, there are some, some efforts to recycle some pieces of uh, uh, plastic, but the, there's another problem that most of the material are biohazard. Stuff mm -hmm. that is coming out of the lab, they are biohazard. So how do you recycle a biohazard plastic is another level of problem. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm hoping that someone is soon going to address that, but you know, funding for research is already limited. People are just <laughs> focusing on research. I guess nobody is really thinking about these things. Right, so that the values of research, of experimentation at the level that you're working on, it's very difficult to expand it into questions of waste and biohazard, obviously. Um, and that's part of this kind of Jen's vision of uh, the toxicity of circular economies. Uh, that we're all involved in, uh, in one way or another, this anthro-obscene, uh, if you will. Uh, but uh, we've come to, uh, I think, uh, our infrastructure is now telling us that uh, we've uh, uh, been here uh, for the amount of time that uh, we've been allotted. 
Uh, but I, I really want to invite everybody. A lot of this, the material will be archived. Uh, I really appreciate uh, Sumeya, Jen, uh, you sharing this work. And uh, the video obviously will be uh, presented at Gallery at Cal IT2, uh, Qualcomm Institute. Uh, we'll see the next part uh, in, the, in the coming week and then the part after that. Uh, so please come back uh, to all the community. And uh, yes, uh, perfume. Uh, thank you for uh, Jen. No <laughs> perfume. No. no perfume. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much, everybody, for coming, uh, for participating. I, I really thank Jen and Sumeya. Uh, we <laughs> hope this discussion uh, grows in other ways in the community here at Cal IT2 and uh, the visual arts department and the gallery. Uh, good night. Thank you, everybody. Thumbs up from Amy. Always a good thing. Uh, adios. Be well, everybody. Bye. Adios.